I would like to thank you very much, Ludo Bianco, for being with us today. It's such a great pleasure and an honor to have you with us today. Thank you, Lou, for being here. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask Steve Sacco to get started. Okay, Steve. good morning. Good morning, CLIA All-Stars. Lou, I call them CLIA All-Stars because they're among the best students I've had in my 46 years of teaching. Wow, I feel fortunate then, wow. In uh, a multitude of different countries. So I, I, when I email them, I always call them the CLIA All-Stars. <laughs> That's great. So um, class um, All-Stars, what I wanted to, you know, we, we talked about Lou, made an introduction um, to Lou last week, uh, but just wanted to uh, mention the most important thing that you need to know about Lou is that he is uh, Professor Ganeri's cousin. <laughs> so it, it goes along. It goes along. Know, this, the, this is unfair, Steve. You shouldn't say. You should not have. Said. Anyway. <laughs> so okay. you better be nice to Lou today because she's listening in the background there, and she plus she's got it taped. No, but uh, guys, you're gonna love Lou as I mentioned before, and Lou's got his book in the back. I've got his book right here in front of me. It's one of the most intriguing and compelling um, readings that I've ever read about an Italian-American family. And Lou, as you know, um, the CLIA All-Stars are writing their histories about their families, many of whom are birds of passage. Their families went to, left Calabria, went to America, and then came back which is a story that Italian Americans don't always hear about. So their, their um, papers, with their permission, um, are going to go into a book entitled Calabrian Voices, because we want them not just to have Professor Ganeri's voice or my voice, we want to hear their particular voices representing them and their families. Um, you're going to really like what they uh, have to say. But guys, this is um, your assignment. Buy this for Christmas for your parents and your families. You're going to love the story. So uh, I'm going to shut up basically and let Lou take over. And I know, Lou, we're going to have tons of questions afterwards, not only about the book, but also your acting career and also um, your storytelling career in uh, the days of the pandemic here. So, Lou, take it away. Uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Margarita, and I'm so pleased to be with everybody here today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen so I can bring up my keynote presentation, so just bear with me. Okay, and I'm going to bring up my keynote here. Okay, um, so can everyone see the uh, title of the uh, presentation? Yes. Yes. Or, I yes. Right. Okay, good. Yes. Uh, good, excellent. Uh, so as Steve told you, um, by trade, I am an actor, singer, and storyteller. And I've told many stories uh, for the past 34 years in my career. But this story is very special to me because it's about somebody in my family. It's about my grandpa or my nonno. Uh, I guess you can tell who the grandfather is and who the grandson is. That's me, Lou, and that's my nonno, Luigi. I was my grandfather's only grandson and his namesake. So, and as you know, that is a very big deal in the Italian culture that the grandson has shares the same name as the grandfather. And so my grandfather and I had a very special bond. And uh, when I used to visit him, which was quite often, he always loved to show me something he made with his own two hands. And I thought this was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. This is a marble bust that my grandfather carved of himself when he was a young man. Uh, I remember standing on a chair and my grandfather taking my little five-year-old fingers and tracing his marble Roman profile. 
I would put his fedora on his own carved head, as you see in the photo. But what I remember most of all was my nonno taking me by the shoulders, and in a very serious voice, he would say, I am Luigi. You are Luigi. Well, two years later, I find this in a drawer. I ask my mother, Ma, what's this? And when my mother tells me, my jaw drops to the floor. Can I show this to my class at school? Now you have to understand, when I was a little boy, I was extremely shy. I didn't speak. The fact that I had six sisters and no brothers might have contributed to that, but that's a whole other story. You know, even as shy as I was, finding this out about my grandpa gave me a confidence I never knew I had. And I could still remember standing in front of my class in second grade, holding this brochure and proudly saying, I want to tell you about my grandpa. And that's why I'm here today, everybody. I want to tell you about my grandpa. His name was Luigi Del Bianco, and he was the chief carver, the carver on this the Mount Rushmore National Memorial. That's right. My nonno is now part of our American history and I'm so pleased to share his unique story with you today. So here it is, Mount Rushmore. It is known the world over. Everybody has seen these images. Doesn't matter where you live. And if you're not sure where it's located, it's in a state in America called South Dakota. It's the orange colored state. They are pretty much in the middle of the country, about um, 1,800 miles from where I live in New York. And there are four presidents that are honored on what is known as the Shrine of Democracy. Why are these four presidents honored on uh, Mount Rushmore? Well, George Washington is honored because he started our democracy by being our first president. And Thomas Jefferson expanded our democracy with the Louisiana Purchase. It literally doubled the size of our country. The land was purchased uh, from France. He also wrote the Declaration of Independence, which gave us freedom from England. Theodore Roosevelt also expanded our democracy with the completion of the Panama Canal, which gave us a faster route from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. He also was a conservationist and protected and helped start many national parks and national forests. And then Abraham Lincoln, who saved our democracy by ending the Civil War and freeing the slaves. So those are the four presidents honored on Mount Rushmore. George Washington started our democracy, Jefferson expanded it, Roosevelt conserved it, and Lincoln saved it. Mount Rushmore. Now you're going to hear this name a lot today. This is the genius sculptor who figured out how to carve giant heads in the side of a mountain. This sculptor's name was Gutzon Borglum. And Gutzon Borglum had 400 men help him to carve these giant faces. But you should know that Gutzon Borglum had only one other classically trained stone carver of his ability to assist him in refining the faces. That other classically trained artist was my nonno Luigi. Now, my nonno uh, lived in America for 49 years, but he was not born here. He was born in Italy, obviously, in the region of Friuli, Venezia, Giulia. Now, because you're Italians, I won't have to explain to you where that is, which is refreshing for me. Uh, he was born in the province of uh, Pordenone in a little uh, borgo named Del Bianco, where all the Del Biancos come from. And when my grandfather was about 12 years old, he carved a little dog out of wood. And my great grandfather, Vincenzo Del Bianco, did something that many parents did with their children years and years and years ago. He sent his son to study under a master carver. And here is an incredible photo from 19, oh, I'm going to say 1905. This is not Italy. My grandfather studied in a carving school for stone carvers in Austria, 
because he lived in Northern Italy and the closest carving school was actually in Austria. Uh, my grandfather is about 13 there, uh, just to the right of the woman. So my grandfather studies under an Italian uh, stone carver in Austria, and he studies there until 1908. And this is actually his diploma. Um, Adami Alois, uh, interesting name, uh, but I was told that he was uh, an Italian stone carver. And you could see it's all written in German. After uh, studying in Austria, he studies in, in, in Vienna and ended up studying even more in Venice until in 1910. And when he's 18, he decides he wants to come to America to carve something special. So he writes to relatives living in Vermont, where there's a giant stone quarry. And they agree to sponsor my nonno. And he comes to America in 1910. And this is the ship that he came in on, the Dante Alighieri. My grandfather goes through Ellis Island and he uh, becomes a memorial stone carver with stone carvers from all over the world. Look at this incredible photo from 1910. Stone carvers from all over the world, not just Italy. Uh, if you look at the guy on the far right and the suspenders and the cap and the pipe, that's my no no. Well, my grandfather spends five years working as a memorial stone carver in Bari, Vermont. But in 1915, Italy is now at war with Prussia in World War I. So what does my grandfather do? He doesn't stay in America. He gets back on a boat and back to Italy to fight with the Italian army. And I, I have read that many Italian immigrants did this. They went back to their home, to their native land to fight. This, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a little ahead of myself. Uh, this is actually an example of a, um, a headstone that my grandfather was carving by hand. I don't know many people that carve headstones by hand today. It's really a lost art. I consider this one of the first selfies. I don't know how my grandfather took this photo, but he must have put it right in front of him. I love it. So back to World War I. This is my grandfather's regiment in Italy. Uh, he's a master sergeant, and he fights in the war. And in 1920, after the war, he decides to come back to America. This time he comes on the La Terrain. Um, he sails out of uh, Le Havre, France, the port of Le Havre, France. He goes through Ellis Island, back to Barry, Vermont, where my grandfather meets another stone carver named Alfonso Scaffa. And Scaffa says, you are very talented. I work for the great sculptor Gutzon Borglum, who has a studio in Connecticut. I want you to meet him. So Alfonso Scaffa brings my grandfather down to Connecticut, which is just north of New York State. And Borglum sees how gifted my grandfather is, and he hires him as his assistant. And my grandfather works under Borglum on many projects for the next 12 years. And Scaffa, well, oh, here, here's Guts and Borglum. And Scaffa brings my grandfather 15 minutes south from Borglum's uh, estate to Port Chester, New York, where my grandfather meets Scaffa's family. And yeah. Alfonso Scaffa introduces my grandfather to a beautiful little four foot 11 beauty named Nicoletta Cartarelli. And my grandfather falls in love and marries her. He becomes my grandmother. Unbelievable. So Alfonso Scaffa, he introduces my grandfather to the great Guts and Borglum. He also introduces my grandfather to my grandmother. So we, my family owes a lot to Alfonso Scaffa. So as I said before, my grandfather works for Borglum for 12 years on different projects all throughout the country, uh, assisting him as his granite expert. But in 1933, Gutzon Borglum has been the designer of Mount Rushmore for almost five years, and he's realizing that the men he's hired can rough out the faces, but he doesn't have trained hands to give the faces refinement of expression. And that's when he brings my grandfather to the mountain. 
He hires my grandfather in 1933 to be the chief carver on Mount Rushmore. My grandfather has the most important job on the mountain, carving the refinement of expression in the faces. When you see the humanity in these faces as if they could live and breathe, that is from the two hands of one person, Luigi Del Bianco. So let's take a little trip back in time. This is Mount Rushmore the way you know it. I'm going to show you Mount Rushmore in 1936. Isn't that amazing? Mount Rushmore still being carved. Look at the little boxes on Washington's face. Those are scaffolds that the men would stand in so they wouldn't fall to their death 500 feet below. And there's my nonno, my grandpa, Luigi, the artist in the studio, measuring the faces of the five foot models of the presidents. Now you might've noticed I'm wearing uh, a white shirt and a striped tie, just like my nonno. I like to do that. I'm going to try to bring my nonno to life for you. Let's all imagine that my nonno is in the studio and he's measuring the eye of Abraham Lincoln. And as he measures the eye, my nonno likes to have a little conversation with his favorite president. And I think it might go a little something like this. <clears throat> ah, President Lincoln, buongiorno. Today we carved the eye, but primo, we measure the points on the eye. Avanti. My friend, Mr. Lincoln, why do all the people say you have an ugly face? To me, you have a beautiful face, quanta si bello. <laughs> oh, amici. Buongiorno, benvenuto. You come to watch Luigi work, huh? Hey, amici, do you know where you are? I'm going to tell you where you are. You are in the studio of the genius, the master, Mr. Gutson Borla. Amici, every day, the master and me, we try to find the best way to measure the small face and move that measurement to the big face on the montagna, the mountain. You see, in the morning, I measure the small eye, but in the afternoon, I carve the big eye. Aha, on a wheel, I am carving the eye of the president. Do you see how big the eye is, Amici? Look at the nose in back of me. When I carve, the sun beats the back of my head, and the wind shakes my scaffold. I feel I'm going to fall out and the dust makes my face white like a ghost. And when I carve, the drill that I hold is 45 pounds, mamma mia. And when I carve the eye, I do it 500 feet in the air, e vero. I take this photo, I stand on top of the head of President Washington. And Amici, all the 400 men and Luigi, how do we get to the top of the mountain every day to work? We walk up 706 steps. Mm -hmm. Every day, up and down, every day. It's like climbing halfway up the Empire State Building. This is the original record of my work on the head of President Jefferson. And Amici, because I am Chief Carver, they pay me more than anyone else. Ah, primo costa, $1.50 an hour. <laughs> I know, this does not sound like much, but remember, in America, this is the depression. There is no work, so $1.50 is very good pay. Ah, Amici. Mi dispiace, all this time, I don't tell you my name. Sono Luigi Del Bianco, Chief Carver on Mount Rushmore. I come to America from Italy to live, to work, to carve. Ma, I miss my family. I miss my wife, Nicoletta. Huh? She is a Bruxelles, huh? Che bellezza. I miss my sons, 
Silvio, Cesare, Vincenzo. So I bring my wife and my sons to live with me in South Dakota while I carve the faces. My boys, they love the Black Hills of South Dakota. But do you know what they love most of all? Uh, they love uh, the, come uh, dice? The cowboys and Indians, yes. <laughs> in fact, the one looking down, Vincenzo, <laughs> he thinks he's an Indian. Oh, he wants to ride every horse he sees. And I tell you something else. He doesn't listen to his papa. So one day I say, Vincenzo, do you see that horse over there? Mm -hmm. That horse belongs to my boss, Guts and Bordla. Vincenzo, you cannot ride that horse. huh? Hey, send him in. You cannot ride. So my son promises and he smiles. And when I leave, what do you think Vincenzo does, huh? Uh, he gets on top of that horse and he says, I am an Indian chief. This is my horse now. And then Vincenzo looks down and who do you think is standing next to the horse? My boss, <laughs> Guts and Bordlum. And Bordlum says, hey, Vincenzo, what are you doing on top of my horse? And Vincenzo smiles and Mr. Bordlum smiles. And Mr. Bordelum puts his hand on the back of my son's neck and he squeezes tight. And Mr. Bordelum picks up my son and he throws Vincenzo off the horse. And my little boy flies through the air like a little bird. A beep, bop, bop, beep, bop, 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 boom. My wife, Nicoletta, she sees this. Do you think she's happy? Hey, amici, let me tell you something about my wife. She is a piccinina. Only four feet, 10 inches tall. But she walks up to Mr. Bordelum and she says, hey, if you touch my son again, I will not allow my husband to come back to carve these faces. Hey, Amici, this is my boss my wife is talking to like this. <laughs> Mr. Bordelum looks down at my wife and says, Mrs. Del Bianco, whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> and now my wife has the la respect, the respect of the master. And Vincenzo says, Papa, I'm sorry I don't listen to you. And I said, that's all right, Vincenzo. You never listen to me. But if you want to learn to ride a horse, I get my brothers to teach you. Amici, would you like to meet my brothers? I show you. Guarda. What? You don't believe these are my brothers. Amici, do you know I, Luigi? I become a blood brother with the chief of Lakota Sioux Indians. See? Si. And the Indians, uh, they teach my sons how to ride a horse. In fact, they teach Vincenzo. And when Mr. Bordelum sees that, he says, Vincenzo, now you could ride my horse. And Vincenzo does look, my boy, he's so happy. <laughs> and to thank the chief, I carved his beautiful face. Ah. And every Sunday, Amici, do you know what my wife Nicoletta does? She goes to the Indian uh, reservation and she cooks macaroni and sauce for the whole Indian tribe. <laughs> they never had macaroni and sauce before. Eh? In fact, she teaches the Indian ladies how to make the sauce. They love my wife's sauce. And before we eat, I always say two things. Salute, Chintani, good health. Good health. 100, 100 years. years. Ah. Ah, ecco. These are the American men, Americani, the men who I teach to carve the faces. They are like my brothers too. But do you think these men are artists like Luigi? No. These men work underground in the coal mine. In the silver mine, Amici. Very dangerous. But then the depression comes, and these men have no work. So Mr. Borlam, he does something crazy. He hires these men, and I have to teach them how to carve. Impossible. But these men are very smart. These men are very brave. Can you do that? These men are very strong. And together, I teach them to carve the faces, and they become just like my brothers. They like me. 
They like the stories I tell, how I fight with the Italian army during World War I. And the Germans, they shoot me 13 times and I do not die. I tell them how I come to America to be American. Oh, Amici, do you know I meet this president? Si, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He shakes my hand and he says, Del Bianco, is that Italian? And I say, 100%. <laughs> ah, mi scusi, my friends. I, I, I talk too much. I am, uh, how do you say, una chiacchierone. Eh? I have to get back to work. I have to finish these faces. The faces are very big, eh? Each face, 60 feet tall. The nose, 21 feet long. The mouth, 18 feet wide. Can you imagine the size of the meatball my wife would have to make for a mouth that big? That's a big meatball, huh? <laughs> yeah, I make a joke. My friends in Porchester, they say, Luigi, how do you carve these faces? They're so big. I say, not on the meat, my friend. You have no idea what this is. How do you say a unique process? Maybe you think to yourself, how did they do this? I'm going to tell you how they do this. But in order to do this, look at the mountain before the faces are there. Mount Rushmore, no faces. Eh? Very different. Eh? And Amici, before we must carve the faces, the first thing we must do is point. You see two small faces, just five feet tall, Washington and Jefferson. Do you see the pole sticking out of the top of their heads? Do you see the string that comes down? There is a weight at the bottom of that string. This is called a pointing machine. And my job is to measure a specific point on the small face, maybe like the tip of the nose. And then I take that measurement and I put it to the big face with a big pointing machine. Do you see the small face? with the pointing machine, and I measure the point, and then I transfer to the big face. We move 10,000 points from little face to big face, Amici, to shape the face. And you have to be perfect when you point, because if you measure wrong and you take off too much stone, you cannot put it back. You have to be perfect when you point. So first, we point. Next. We blast. Here we go. Baboom. I do the sound effect. Eh? <laughs> grande, grande. <laughs> you cannot uh, take off the stone with a hammer and a chisel. The faces are too big. Do you know we take off 80% of the stone on Mount Rushmore with dynamite? But remember, friends, when we blast off the stone, we have to be perfecto because if we blast off too much, you cannot put it back. You have to be perfect when you blast. So we point and then we blast. Next, we drill. Look at the men, how they drill. They drill down, down, down to within maybe three inches of each measured point. Huh? Look, they lower the men from a cable in a bosun seat down, down the side of the faces till they get to the place where they must drill. And they drill and they drill. Right now, this is a photo I show you of the face of President Washington. As they drill the face, he starts to come to life. So we point, we blast, and we drill. Next, we honeycomb. Look at the men, how they drill the holes very close together, very close together. Why do we do that? Huh? This is me, Luigi. I am honeycombing. And why do I drill the holes so close together? Because it gives me more control when I break off the holes. And that takes us now to the finished part of the face. So we point, we blast, we drill, and we honeycomb. And then we finish. Sono io Luigi. I am on the mountain. And they bring to me a five-foot mask of Abraham Lincoln. But this time, Amici, I do not measure. 
I take the hands of the artist, eh? and I study the small face, and then I go to the big face, which is right next to me. Do you see it on the left? And I put refinement of expression in that face, something only an artist can do. And when I am done, Amici, it looks a little like this. So Amici, that is the five-part process of how we carve the faces. We point, we blast, we drill, we honeycomb, and we finish. Ah, va bene. You know, my friends in Porchester, they always ask me, Luigi, do you have many problems when you try to carve these faces? And I say, Maronda me, you have no idea how many problems we have, but we never give up. We always find another way. I'm going to show you the original model of Mount Rushmore. Hey, Amici, very different, eh? Look at President Washington and Lincoln. They have a body. They look like they're going to get up and walk away. Why did we not carve the body below the faces? I'm going to tell you why. Because much of the stone below the faces is called pegmatite stone. Pegmatite stone is filled with crystals like mica and quartz. And when you try to carve stone with crystals inside, oh, the stone falls apart. We have a very big problem carving below the faces. But what do we do? We don't give up. We decide to just carve the faces, and I think they look very nice this way. Uh -huh. This is how we start, and this is how we finish. Oh. President Jefferson, what's he doing over there? Amici, did you know President Jefferson was supposed to be the first face on the mountain? But what happens? We hit the pegmatite stone, mica, quartz, the face that falls apart. We have a big problem. But we don't give up. We take dynamite and we blast off the bad face and we put Mr. Jefferson on the other side of Mr. Washington, where you see him today. And this is why President Roosevelt. He looks a little uh, smushy, smushy, you know, because he had to move over one, but <laughs> I think he's used to it by now, huh? Oh, son of Luigi, I am carving the lip of President Jefferson. Ah, one day, Amici, I am home in Port Chester. I have my wine, and I listen to the radio, and I sing a little Italian song. Maybe I sing a little for you, huh? The words might not be perfect, uh, but I try. Eh? Let me see. <clears throat> oh, so mio, time from the are. Oh, so mio, time from the are. Oh, so le, oh, so. But Amici, I get a letter from my boss, Guts and Borlam, and he says, Oh, Bianco, you must come to the mountain subito. There is a dangerous crack in the leap of Jefferson, filled with pegmatite stone. And a crack, it grows and grows, and I trust only you can fix it. So, Amici, what do I do? I get in my car and I drive for 1,800 miles to South Dakota. And uh, because there is no Italian food in South Dakota, I put in the back seat of my car uh, provolone, soprasette, capicola, because I have to have my Italian food. Eh? And I walk up those 706 steps, Amici. And I look at that bad crack and I say, oh, Malada, I have to fix this. And so I point it, and I honeycomb it, and I carve it, and I finish it. And Amici, when I am done, you cannot even tell the crack was there. So I guess you can say, I, Luigi, yeah, I saved the face of Thomas Jefferson. <sighs> oh, Amici, I'm sorry I have to go. I look at my watch. I have to finish measuring the eye of the president. But I want to say one more thing, and something I need to say to you now. 
When I was a boy in Italy, ah, when I was a boy in Italy, I have a big dream to come to America to carve something special. Amici, my dream, it comes true, see? This is my passion, to be an artist. Amici, my friends, do you have a passion, huh? Do you have something you love to do, something you need to do every day? I tell you, do it. Work hard. Give the gift you have. Live your life. La vita bella. I am Luigi Del Bianco, and I say to you, ciao. So that is my nonno, Luigi Del Bianco. He came from a small village in Italy to America to carve presidents' faces. If that's not the American dream, I don't know what is. And this is his amazing story. I'm so pleased to share it with you today. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, a lot of people ask me, what did your grandfather do after Mount Rushmore? I mean, how do you follow Mount Rushmore, right? Well, my grandfather was a brilliant artist, of course, but he was also an immigrant. And he was grateful to come to this country to work to lead a better life. And that's exactly what he did. He created a little studio in his home here where you see many busts. And he continued to be a memorial stone carver where he carved 500 headstones in our own local cemetery, all by hand. This is just not done anymore. This is a legacy in itself, I think. He went back to Italy many times to be with family and friends. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the giant man next to my grandfather, maybe because you're younger me or maybe your parents or grandparents know who this is. But Primo Carnera, who was the Italian heavyweight champion of the world in this country, uh, was a paisano of my grandfather uh, from Seguals in Friuli, just a couple villages over. And they became very, very good friends. In fact, there's a legend that when my great grandfather died, La Primo insisted on being the only pallbearer. In other words, he wanted to be the only one to carry the coffin through the church. And looking at the size of him, I think he was easily could have done it. Um, I just wanted to share that with you. This is a, a, a he's a wonderful member of our family in a way. Uh, my grandfather was honored by the National Sculpture Society for his work as a stone carver. Okay, now everybody always asks me, which of the three boys was my father? Well, unfortunately, it was Vincenzo who didn't listen to anybody. And let me tell you something, that never changed. My father loved living in the Black Hills. He did not want to go back to New York. In fact, he even continued to act like an Indian chief. But my father had a passion as well. He wanted someday to go back to Mount Rushmore as an adult and ride a horse again. So here's my father in 1936, at just seven years old, and here he is at 65 years old in 1991, riding a horse again. But nobody threw him off the horse this time. He was way too big. This is my Aunt Gloria, who wasn't even born when Mount Rushmore was being carved. But I want to acknowledge her today because, well, we lost her not too long ago. She was Luigi's last surviving child. And she was always so proud of her papa's uh, great talent. There's that beautiful bust I thought you'd like to see of my grandpa uh, without the hat. And here are some other things that the family has that my grandfather carved. This is my uncle Silvio, carved by his papa Luigi. A mosaic of Abraham Lincoln. There's a, uh, a famous uh, mosaic school, School of Mosaic in Spilimbergo, where my grandfather comes from. He had studied there. George Washington. Theodore Roosevelt, this is called motherhood, absolutely beautiful. Now I had a passion and a dream myself. It was always my dream to perform this show at Mount Rushmore. So in 2011, I contacted the staff at Rushmore and said that for a very small fee, I would perform all throughout the 4th of July weekend. And their response was, I'm sorry, we don't have a budget to pay you. And I said, that's okay. I'll come and do it for nothing. That's how much this meant to me. 
And do you know what their response was? Well, we don't have room for you on the schedule. Can you believe that? Well, I decided I wasn't going to give up. I was going to persevere just like my grandfather did in his life. So I very politely harassed the staff at Mount Rushmore for three months, calling them every day, asking again and again, and it paid off. Here's my nonno in the studio in 1936. Here I am in the same studio with the models, becoming my nonno. I am Luigi, you are Luigi. It was just a day that I'll never forget. I'm trying to spread this story wherever I go. This is the Italian American Museum in Manhattan, where there is an exhibit about the Italian chief carver of Mount Rushmore. I even went to a popular uh, American television show. I'm not sure you might be familiar with it. Check it out. I would like you to make a Mount Rushmore cake. But I'm excited. We are gonna get your grandpa the recognition that he deserves. Fantastic. Okay. Roosevelt should be over a little bit. You, you move them too much. Oh, we got a lot of ice cream. Right. Cool. All right, let's cut that. Call it. If you wet your brush, we would all go over what I go over. Oh, that's good. So, what do you think? Thanks so much. Who wants to see some cake? So, the Cake Boss television show and Buddy Velastro created a seven foot high Mount Rushmore cake. Believe it or not, that is a cake. We had a Luigi Del Bianco day in Port Chester. And now the two million people who watch the show every year learn about my non no. I realized that people in my hometown of Porchester had never heard of my nonno. So I raised $25,000 to create a, a beautiful memorial plaque so that the people would not forget him. I created a website, LuigiMountRushmore.com. You can go to this website, learn more about my nonno, and you could also read about the second half of this story, which I think is as interesting as the first half. And why do I say that? Well, in order to tell you about it, I have to start with a book. This book. This is a book written by Rex Allen Smith called The Carving of Mount Rushmore. It was written in 1985. This is the definitive book on Mount Rushmore. My grandfather is not mentioned once. That's right. The chief carver, it's as if he didn't even exist on the project. And I could still remember my Uncle Caesar saying, that's like talking about the New York Yankees and not mentioning DiMaggio. And I thought that was a very apt analogy. Seeing my Uncle Caesar so upset, it brought me back to my experience with me and my grandpa and our special bond. I am Luigi, you are Luigi. And so my uncle and I decided to find out the truth about Luigi the rest of the story, because history doesn't always tell you the whole story, right? It started with my first pilgrimage to Mount Rushmore in 1988. I said to the staff, how are you honoring the chief carver, Luigi Del Bianco? Where is his plaque? This is the plaque they showed me. These are all of the 400 workers who worked on the mountain, from laborers to drillers to secretaries, to the man who put the soul into the faces on the mountain. To me, this was just wrong. It was like taking the star of a movie and making him an extra. It just made no sense. So my uncle Caesar and I decided to do a little research to make a case for our descendant, our ancestor. We went to the Library of Congress, the biggest library in the world. That's my uncle Cesare. Uh, my grandfather's youngest son, and he, again, he's not with us, but I always know that he smiles down on me when I do this program. Let me just read to you some of the incredible documentation that we found in the Library of Congress in the words of Guts and Borglum. Borglum writes this. He writes, in 1933, I notified Tallman and my son Lincoln, who was pointing, that I was bringing with me as an assistant 
a semi-sculptor who had been with me off and on in the East for 12 years, a powerful, capable granite man who I had converted into an efficient marble cutter. I was immediately notified that his presence here was objected to and that the Mount and that the Rapid City office did not want him. I ignored this and put him immediately in charge of the work and the workmen on Washington's head, meaning the face and wig. He, meaning Luigi, complained to me within a week of the treatment he was being accorded from the Rapid City office. Rudeness, insolence, and petty dickering about wages. He remained here on my orders and my account, but he will never come again. My uncle and I discovered that my grandfather quit Mount Rushmore several times because of bullying and harassment and his life being made miserable. Borglum continues, he is worth any three men I can find in America for this particular type of work. He entirely outclassed everyone on the hill and his knowledge was an embarrassment to their amateur efforts and lack of knowledge, lack of experience and lack of judgment. He is the only man besides myself who has been on the work, who knows the problems and how to instantly solve them. Borglum ends by saying, the loss of Bianco will probably prevent the finishing of the Washington and Jefferson heads this year. So think about it. When my grandfather quit, all finishing on the heads had to stop because he was the only one who could do it. Well, Borglum is desperate. He has to have his chief carver. So he makes a deal with the Mount Rushmore Commission in charge of the project. He says, I've decided we must keep Bianco and keep him happy. If he were working for me, I'd be paying him 11 or $12. I want him to receive a dollar an hour. You may charge me with the difference. The help he is, his ability to understand is worth much more to the work. Gustin Borglum took out a second mortgage on his house to pay my grandfather to keep him. That's how important Luigi was. So I have good news. My grandfather decides to stay. Out of loyalty to the men he's training, to Borglum and this great privilege granted him. He stays in 1933, 35, and 36. But in 1937, he leaves again and vows never to return. And Borglum says, he is the only intelligent, efficient stone carver on the work who understands the language of the sculptor. Well, 1938 goes by, 1939 goes by, no Bianco. Borglum is desperate and he complains to the commission. For the purpose of Washington's red tape, a portion of our better men are designated as carvers. There are no carvers on the mountain. There has never been but one and he refused to return because of the chronic sabotage directed at him by influences in Rapid City and the Park Department. Now, I have to tell you, sabotage is a very strong word, and I'm sorry to say I don't know the details of what my grandfather was put through other than arguing about his pay. My grandfather was a very strong and proud individual, so whatever was done to him must have been pretty bad. He never talked about it, and we never asked him. Well, after 1938 and 39, Borglum decides that he has to try one more time to get his chief carver back, because otherwise the mountain will never be finished the way he wants it. So in 1940, he writes to my grandpa. He says, Dear Bianco, I wish you would come as soon as you can if you want to be of help to me. I must finish the faces by the 1st of July and all of them. I need you. Your pay will be exactly what it was before, and there are no reductions from it. You are the only man who was on that pay. Well, my grandfather doesn't answer that letter, so Borglum writes again. My dear Bianco, you better be here by May 1st, and I'm glad you will come. You will work for me, and nobody else will trouble you. Here you see, once again, Borglum is trying to assure my grandfather that when he goes back to Rushmore, he will finally be left alone. I wish I knew what they did to him. Well, more good news. My grandfather decides to return for one more season to finish the job. And at this point, he is literally the only man working on the mountain. And why do I know this? Because Richard Sarazani, whose father, Arthur, another Italian, worked with my grandfather during that season of 1940. And in a book that Richard wrote about his father, 
he quotes a, 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 a section of uh, Arthur's journal where Arthur says, Mount Rushmore is as silent as a tomb. There is only one man working on the faces, and that is Bianco. And I'll tell you, that image always blows me away, that in 1940, for that whole season, you see five, four incredible granite faces and one solitary little figure finishing them and giving them refinement of expression. That was Luigi. And so my grandfather does what Borglum asks him to do. And he and the men who work under him have his admiration, love, and respect. We asked Matt Riley, who worked under my grandfather, would you say Luigi was the best carver? And Matt Riley said, oh, yes, you can see what you've got up there. That testimony alone should give my grandfather a plaque. George Rumpel worked for my grandfather and said, he was not only a carver, he was a genius. He taught me a lot. And I think if he had to take over from Mr. Borglum, he could finish the mountain himself. At the end of my grandfather's life, he had this to say about his time at Rushmore. I do it again, knowing all the hardships involved. I would work at Rushmore even without pay if necessary. It was a great privilege granted me. Well, you could understand how excited my Uncle Caesar and I were. After six trips to the Library of Congress, when we presented 75 primary source documents to the staff at Rushmore, convinced that they would finally recognize him as Chief Carver and give him his own plaque. Do you know what their response was? These papers are all well and good, but your grandfather was not the Chief Carver. He was a worker. He will be credited with the other 400 workers. No one will be singled out. Do you know that my Uncle Caesar and I gave those same papers to every superintendent and every chief of interpretation and every park ranger at Mount Rushmore for 25 years? Yes, maybe longer than some of you have been alive. And every time we got the same answer, your grandfather was not the chief carver, he was a worker, he will be credited with the group. Well, after 25 years, I was ready to give up. But I decided now to go over the heads of the staff at Rushmore. I went to a man named Michael Reynolds, yep, who was in charge of all of the national parks in the Midwest region of our country. And when he read those papers, he said, this is very impressive. Let me talk to the people at Rushmore to change their minds. And I thought, wow, I had finally made a breakthrough. I was so excited. A month later, I got a, a form letter from Mr. Reynolds who said, your grandfather was not the chief carver. He was a worker. Blah, 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 blah. Well, I have to tell you, this time I really thought I hit a wall. I was ready to give up, really, for the last time. But then this guy came along. Cam Sholly. Mm -hmm. He was Michael Reynolds' successor. And I thought, Ufa, <laughs> what have I got to lose after 25 years? So I gave those same papers to Cam Sholly. And do you know what? When Cam Sholly was done, filamente, as my grandpa would say, this finally happened. The man depicted here was arguably a cut above the other stone carvers he worked with. But acknowledging that required a rewriting of the history of one of our nation's most beloved monuments. Jim Axelrod takes us to the Black Hills of South Dakota. Mount Rushmore's designer, Gutzon Borglum, once said he hoped the faces would remain unchanged until the wind and rain alone shall wear them away. The monument, carved into granite, was designed to be as enduring as it was inspiring. The team that created this memorial exemplifies the perseverance of the American spirit. Which is why this ceremony held yesterday was so remarkable as the National Park Service marked a change at Mount Rushmore. Three, two, one. A small but significant revision to the story of its creation. 48 years after his death, an Italian immigrant named Luigi Del Bianco was officially recognized as Mount Rushmore's chief carver. So there he is, 
performing a, a little surgery. Yeah, it is plastic surgery. On Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> it's really granite surgery. As Luigi Del Bianco's grandson Lou explained to us, the chief carver was the master craftsman in charge of refining the expression in the faces. So the twinkle in Lincoln's eye. Yep. Or Jefferson's lips. Yep. That's Luigi Del Bianco's work? Yes. Since Rushmore's completion in 1941, the 400 laborers had always been saluted as a group. But for the last 30 plus years, the Del Bianco family had been making the case Luigi wasn't just part of the crowd. If we're looking at Rushmore, what of Luigi Del Bianco's work am I seeing that separates him out and makes him deserving of his own plaque? Well, when people tell me their impression of the faces, they say that there's a humanity. There's a humanity in that granite. And I'm convinced that my grandfather helped bring that humanity out. Trained in Italy as a stone carver, Luigi Del Bianco came to America in 1908 at the age of 16, settling eventually in Port Chester, New York, where he opened a business. So in Port Chester, New York, there are headstones carved by the same man who did Rushmore? Yeah, and I can't tell you how many times an older person in town would say, can you believe it? The man who carved the president's faces carved my mother's headstone. Unbelievable. Lou Del Bianco grew up knowing all about his grandfather's special role at Rushmore. What do we have in here? Well, those are about 75 documents from the Library of Congress. Including testimony from Goots and Borglum. He is worth any three men I can find in America for this particular type of work here and now. This is Borglum's writing. Oh, yeah. But nothing Lou showed the Park Service would change the narrative. At least not until Cam Shally took over the regional office in charge of Rushmore. You know, there's a, uh, a pay sheet that has his name, Chief Carver, $1.50 an hour. The more Shally read of what Lou sent him, the more he realized the story of Rushmore needed rewriting. I found myself wondering if, if we should change course here. So Shally dispatched a couple of National Park Service historians to Lou's basement in Port Chester. They went through the booklet that I showed you. By the fourth page, one of the historians said, well, you sold me, let's go have lunch. And after years of making Luigi's case, the official policy was overturned. We have Luigi Del Bianco in that visitor center. When there were pictures of him, his name's in there. We just haven't called him Chief Carver, and now we will. Well, now we all know Gustav Borglum, of course, but he didn't do it alone. There were about 400 people who helped him. The decision made at headquarters may take a little while to filter down to the tours. We got this recognition coming to Luigi mm -hmm. Del Bianco. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a neat part of the story, isn't it? I don't know that part of the story, so I can't say. Are you going to have to brush up on Luigi? Well, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. But Lou Del Bianco isn't concerned, knowing he's got history on his family's side. And now, a plaque to prove it. What an incredible day. Uh, September 16th, 2017. I was able to unveil that plaque with Cam Shally. So pleased that he was there. He's really the guy that made it happen when so many others wouldn't do anything. Uh, La Familia was there. And if you ever decide to go to Mount Rushmore, and you never know, you may do that, I hope you'll look for Luigi because he'll be looking for you. Now, at the same time that the plaque was being unveiled at Mount Rushmore, another plaque was being unveiled. Luigi Del Bianco, Capo Scalpellino sul Monte Rushmore, un fiero friulano. This is Borgo Del Bianco, the little paese uh, outside of Meduno. Uh, where my grandfather was born. Uh, it still looks like uh, the 19th century. I love it. And the people there are just as proud of him, maybe even more.
We had Dan Rather and Alan Alda, the actor, and singer Tony Bennett all acknowledge my grandfather's great achievement. <clears throat> so, finalmente, the history has finally been changed for the better. The historical record has been set. And uh, when I was working with those historians, they said to me, Lou, you are a storyteller. You need to tell this story. And that's what I've done. I've written a book entitled Out of Rushmore Shadow, The Luigi Del Bianco Story. Um, it's written in English on Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. You could also get it in Italian on the Italian Amazon. So that's, uh, you know, FYI, just uh, your choice there. Um, you'll learn more about my grandfather's immigrant journey, his time at Rushmore with tons of incredible photos, and the 25 year roller coaster ride where my family tried to get him the credit that he deserved. You will not, <laughs> you won't be able to put it down. It reads like a, it reads like a novel. Um, and with that, uh, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions uh, that you have. Um, Margarita, Stephen, should I should I stop sharing the screen at this point? Uh, yes. Why don't we go back to your handsome face? <laughs> and I know that the students are going to have uh, innumerable questions for you. Yeah. No, I'm here as long as you'd like. Go ahead, guys. Um, um, we just we think that such a presentation with singing and acting evolve. Uh, they, it deserves an applause. So sorry, but yes. <laughs> <Just> oh, thank <laughs> <you>. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mille grazie. I appreciate that. So go ahead. Uh, who wants to start uh, with the questions? I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Go ahead, Marielle. Okay, I hope you see me. I so, can't. I, yes, I do see you. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, in your opinion, uh, what is the American um, opinion on the role of Italians in American history? Like, do they value that as important, or as maybe just a side role, or maybe they ju just, I don't know, don't care about it at all? Wow, that's a great question. I think it's, I think, um, and I'm sure Stephen will agree with me that uh, the Italian American contribution to the history of our country is a little complicated. Depending on who you talk to, um, the, uh, the Italian American icon can range from Christopher Columbus, who discovered America, or they say discovered America. Uh, to um, uh, to uh, Vito Corleone, the Godfather, the Mafia. Unfortunately, I have found, and I'm sure Stephen could back me up here. I'm talking to you, I have found that many people in our community idolize uh, the Mafia, um, as told by the Godfather movies and Goodfellows. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with these these movies where people like to emulate and honor in their own way the idea of the family becoming powerful by uh, living outside of the rule of law in this country and become, you know, and, the, and that the violence that goes with that is not um, seen as uh, uh, necessarily a negative thing. So I've seen that. Um, would I love Americans to recognize that, you know, so much of New York City and the, the, all parts of this country were built by Italians? I wish people were more aware of that. It's always refreshing when I when I run into people who care about that, who care about um, uh, the gentleman who painted the beautiful mural on the in the dome of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., Brumidi. A lot of people don't even know about him. And ironically, it was an American senator's wife who got him recognized. It wasn't an Italian. So I, this is kind of a painful subject for me. Um, I wish that Italian Americans were just as proud as I am and Stephen of the contributions of Italian Americans. And that's one of the reasons why I'm telling this story. 
because I want Americans to know that it was an Italian, an Italian American who brought those presidents' faiths to life. Uh, because many people in this country love Mount Rushmore. I hope that answers your question. And so I don't know, Stephen, if you want to speak to that at all. No, I want to keep quiet and let the students talk. Um, okay. <laughs> there's, so, there's so many hands up right now, but I think Jada was next. Yeah, but sorry, Lou, we don't see you anymore. Oh, okay. Where am I? I think I, I I had my camera turned off. Uh, now it's working now. Oh, I'm we'll sorry. I don't know thank what I did. All right, thank you. Okay. Hi. 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 So nice to meet you. I Me really appreciate your presentation, the way you spoke to us. I, I laughed a lot. Oh, so thank my, you. So my question for you is, in your opinion, how would your nonno Luigi del Bianco feel if he knew that today he has a place of honor inside the Italian American Museum? Uh, I think he would be very proud and very humbled. He was very, very proud individual, very strong, but I think he was also very, very grateful to be living in America and to have made the contribution that he did. So I think he would be feeling two things. I think he would feel very proud and also very humble and grateful. And uh, the fact that his son and his grandson made it happen for him, I would think would make his heart very full. He would say, sono contento. <laughs> okay, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, it's a great question. Margarita, I don't know who is next. Okay, <laughs> Joanna. Hi. Hello, Joanna. Hi, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, first, let me tell you that I find very poetic the fact that your grandfather worked both for a great project like um, the Mount Rushmore, and he also humbly, so humbly um, uh, carved graves. And I find it very poetic. And he sh it shows the humanity and the dignity of the immigrant works. So um, there are so many stories like this uh, about the invisible work of immigrants that has given a huge contribution in the building of cities and their infrastructures. Uh, what do you think a state can do in order to give them the recognition that they deserve? Is a memorial plate enough? It, it's, uh, I know, uh, I, you, you see how long it took me and my family to get my grandfather recognized. What does it take? It takes a lot of work and a lot of luck and a lot of timing. I mean, what if that gentleman, Cam Shali, was not in that position of power at that time? I might still be trying to get my grandfather a plaque. If I've learned anything, I've learned that you just have to be patient and you have to keep trying and trying and trying. And whenever you feel like you want to give up, step back from your pursuit, do something else, and then you will come back with fresh eyes. Um, dealing with the government is very, very difficult. It's very difficult. There is so much in this country, we call it red tape. You have to go through red tape in order to achieve your goal. Uh, is a plaque enough? No, I don't think it's enough. I'm very happy to have it. Um, I've written a screenplay for the movies, and I have been shopping that screenplay because I would love to see my grandfather's story on the big screen. So let's all keep our fingers crossed for that. Um, I hope that answered your question. I agree with you about the um, the invisible people. Do you all know that the, the are you familiar with the Lincoln Memorial in uh, Washington, D.C., with Abraham Lincoln sitting on a throne in Washington, D.C.? Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. Uh, if you Google Lincoln Memorial in Washington, it's one of the most famous uh, carvings uh, in our country. That was carved by the Picciarelli brothers, six Italians who settled in the Bronx, New York. They finally got a small plaque, but it's put off to the side. You have to really look for it. 
So there's this dichotomy of getting the recognition and always wondering if, if you could have done more. But um, I just thought I'd share the Piccirilli brothers. Again, another example of Italians who contributed such beautiful artwork and, and, and aren't getting the credit they deserve. Great question. Danny, I think you're next. Uh, there are other um, other students before me. Oh, I'm sorry. I, you know, I can't you tell because. Partner. Paola is next. Paola. Yeah, I'm here. Can you see me? Yes, I can, Paola. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's, it's a very pleasure to meet you today. I'm very glad about it. Thank and you. I want, just want to ask you, um, how do you feel to be like being the grandson of just important person like your grandfather? Because we can say that he is part of the history of the United States. And how do you, of course, I'm, I'm sure you are proud, of, you are just great grand proud of him. Mm -hmm. But my question is, um, how... Um, um, how do you feel to keep the image of Italians in America, seeing how your grandfather, seeing the situation of your grandfather in America that took place? Because I, I saw that he was like, he did, uh, he had just um, discriminated, he was discriminated. So how is this, how do you feel about it? I, um, even though even though Italian Americans have become very successful in this country, I mean, we have Italian American millionaires, we have Italian American movie stars, Italian American scientists like Dr. Anthony Fauci with the virus. We have um, uh, people on the Supreme Court who are Italian Americans. I still feel like I still feel like we are treated like. Um, um, in the same way that my grandfather might have been treated, that we can't be trusted, that we're low class, that we're uneducated, and that we only respond through violence, like the mafia. Um, and it's strange too, because we have achieved a lot in this country, but I still think there is uh, that element. When I go outside of, my, uh, of New York, um, I see that happen. Um, I was uh, performing, I performed for children, and I was performing in the south of, 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 of this country, uh, where there are really no, really no Italians, or very few, and the gentleman who introduced me could not pronounce my name, and after he mispronounced my name, he said, I better not get this man angry at me, he might be related to the Sopranos. Are you familiar with the Sopranos, the television show? It's a television show about the mafia and the audience laughed and I never got any jobs <laughs> from that uh, showcase. And I think I know why, because of the, the tone that was set. Um, and so I'm not saying that I, I went through what my grandfather went through in any way. In fact, I've been very fortunate and very grateful, but there's still an element of that. And I'm very, um, uh, it's interesting to me that my grandfather never talked about the discrimination against him. He was very, very proud. In fact, if one of his paisani said, oh, this country, and they complained about the country, my grandfather would say, then go back, he'd say. Go back. This country's been good to me. So he always spoke very well about his experience in America. He would not speak about the problems he had. Um, and I, I, I just think he was, he was very proud and very, uh, very proud that way. Um, as, as his grandson, I am just so excited to let America and the world know that here is an Italian immigrant who made such an important contribution, and he wasn't part of the mafia, and he wasn't um, a criminal. Uh, he was an artist, and he had to study to learn his craft, and that he comes from a long descendancy of great artists and scientists. So proud of him. Margarita, can you tell who is next? Thank you so much. Stephen, am I talking too long? I don't want to be no, long. No, no, there. no. You just be yourself. Right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. Elisabetta. 
Hi, can you, you hear me? Yes. I can, yes. I'm sorry, but I have prob problems with my connection today. Oh, no problem, not a problem. Uh, okay. Thank you for being thank you for being here today. And uh, did you inherit the talent of sculpture? Have you ever tried to to do it, to do it? No, no. Um, the only member of my family who had some ability was my um, uncle Silvio. Uh, he studied a little under my grandfather, but I think he was um, a little intimidated by my grandfather's genius, so he stopped. Um, so my grandfather's the only one in the family um, that uh, possessed that that great talent uh, that that I know of. But I t I bring people to life by telling their story, and he brings people to life uh, by by carving them. So we have that in common. Okay, thanks. Oh, you're welcome. You have another talent. You're also an artist, Lou. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, now Daniela. Daniela. Okay. Here I am. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. My pleasure. And it is a pleasure and a honor for us. And thank you, thank you also for your great story and your great presentation. Thank you. Um, well, my question is, <laughs> it's a little bit funny. That's if okay. it's possible. Um, would you like to add uh, another president on Mount Rushmore? <laughs> <laughs> you know, people have tried. People have tried. Um, do you know Ronald Reagan? He was a president in our country uh, about 40 years ago, 30 to 40 years ago. Um, there was a woman who helped get American women the right to vote in this country, and her name was Susan B. Anthony. There was a movement to get her put on the mount. Um, um, I don't know if I want to go there, but our president now, President Trump. <laughs> I hope I didn't awaken the sleeping giant that is Stephen Sacco, who might, who might. <laughs> but, but President Trump thinks he should be on Mount Rushmore. Um, you cannot put any more faces on Mount Rushmore because of the pegmatite stone. There's no more carvable stone on the, uh, on the mountain. Um, there are people that have tried. I know, I know President Trump wants to be on there, but, it, but it's not going to happen. Do I have a president that I think should be on Mount Rushmore? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really, uh, I think that um, I look at Mount Rushmore like the Mona Lisa. I look at my, Mount Rushmore like, like like the David, why would you add to those pieces of art? You know, leave leave it as it is. Great question. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? I don't see hands up. No, but I have a question, if okay. I may. Yeah. Okay, Lou, first of all, let me tell tell you that really, I had tears in my eyes. Your <laughs> presentation moved me. I mean, it's. Really, really touching. Thank I you. I knew about, you know, of course, the story. I read your books, but I've never really watched, listened to the an entire presentation. Right, right. And you're right. Let me see. And I have a question for you. Um, how was your book, and in general, all your work on uh, in this on, on your nano to for for the recognition on your nano at Mount Rushmore received? How was all these received by Italian American scholars? in the US and especially scholars in your area, because you know we know that there is a very important center of research in New York. Yes. Um, I have not been able to get my book into those circles. Oh. This That's is not I'm happened. I've, 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 I've had, I have uh, not um, been asked uh, to perform my show uh, with the Calandra Institute, but it's a little complicated, as you know, Margarita, because a previous book had been written about my grandfather through through Bordighera Press. So that's probably not going to happen. I have, um, I did, I will say, and I had a great experience where I was able to perform my program uh, at um, 
uh, Loyola College in, uh, in Chicago with the professor there who knows you very well. And of course, her name escapes me. Is it Carla? Yeah, Carla Simonini. Yeah, in Carla. fact, your name came up many times as somebody just beloved by the professors there. Uh, it was another professor who I loved. She was a little she, cute little, cute here. little lady. She's here and she's the next person who raised her hand. Anna Clara, you can talk, Anna. Yeah. She's here. Anna. Clara, she's coming. coming. Yes. Hi, Clara. Ciao, Lou. How can you forget me? Oh, I'm disgusting. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. You're, because you are. You're adorable. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was all positive, though. It was a good <laughs> Well, it's true that it's difficult to remember my name. You don't, re you don't forget my height, probably because no, I'm no, small. I don't forget. <laughs> Listen, my mother was your size. The, I don't forget your your spirit and your face and your your spirit. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Oh, I hope okay. you go back to Chicago, to Loyola University. We had a great class. We, I want to tell all the other students that we got together, uh, students and also high school students who were invited to join us because yeah. we have a great pretty program. And Lou performed. It was very well uh, liked by everybody. It was a great success. It's a great story that means a lot to all of us. I want to ask you one question, Lou. I did not ask you that at the time. What were your grandpa's political views? Could be that he must uh, have expressed something. Those were difficult years of Italian in America, late 20s and early 30s. I wonder if that did make a difference in being him uh, treated differently? Yeah, that's you know, a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I believe my um, uncle Caesar told me that later on when he voted, he was, he was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. But in his younger years, in fact, I think I might have had Margarita translate a paper that I think might have been in my grandfather's handwriting that implied that he had very uh, strong socialist um, leanings. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it might have. In fact, there was a socialista group yeah. club in Portchester where I live. And I heard that my grandfather was one of the gentlemen who would go in this basement <laughs> with other Italians. More than that, you know, in Illinois, there was a group of anarchists. Right. Yeah, and I don't think my grandfather was uh, in that in that uh, category, but he I think he was more like a, he was probably more like Sacco and Vendetti. I mean, they were socialists, but they were not anarchists. Right. I mean, it, it has been proven that he that they got caught up in the prejudice at the time. Um, but I I think he was very sympathetic with Sacco and Vendetti, and that was like 1926. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, never had that question. You've got me thinking. Yeah. yeah, so that, that's yeah, pretty that cool. the opposite. The opposite. My mom, a US citizen, because she was born in New York, uh, then uh, back to Italy, uh, went to a boarding school in Roma for seven years. You know, there is no document, zero, zero, about her being there for seven years. Why? She was a US citizen, an enemy. So the ones of the boarding school did have her. I mean, she was studying there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but there is nothing about her. Wow! And why do you think that is? Because she was a U.S. citizen, and in Italy, those years, yeah, it was okay. during the political time, and so she was considered an enemy. Were your grandparents citizens too? My only my grandpa, not my grandma. So her, her parents, right. they were in New York. They emigrated to New York and then uh, back to Italy. My at least my grandma with the three kids. And so my mom was sent to this boarding school in Rome, but uh, again, nothing zero. Mm -hmm. You see, Clara, on my father's side of the family, they lived in an area of my town that was all Italian. So during the war that my father didn't experience a lot of prejudice. My mother's family, 
who were from Southern Italy, um, lived in a part of town that was Irish and German. Not, no, Irish, mostly Irish. My mother and my grandparents encountered terrible prejudice because they thought that they were secretly um, loyal to Mussolini. So my mother had many, many terrible stories of how badly they were treated until my uncle Carmen, who came here as a young boy, went into the military and he was walking home in his uniform and their jaws dropped. And it was only then that, that, that the prejudice stopped, that they saw he was fighting for, for our country. Okay. So that, that, that's a story that was handed down to me. Margarita, can you tell who's yes, next? Gabriele. Clara, thank you. I hope I didn't embarrass you. I, it's <laughs> all from <under> perfection. <laughs> 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 Hope to see you soon. <laughs> ciao. Ciao, ciao. Ciao. Oh man, that was funny. We have a few minutes left, but there are two more questions. Also, I would like to ask Alessandra De Marco. Alessandra, I would like to introduce to this our speakers. And Mariela first. Yes, Mariela. Question, but um, I hope it doesn't sound like an absurd question. But it is about your careers as actor and also as a storyteller. Um, is there something you bring that you, you take from your actor career and you take into your storytelling? Because obviously we are interested in storytelling. So also, if you have some concrete advice for us, because we are trying to write our stories. So I wanted to I wanted to know if you have some advice and if there is something very special that you know because you're an actor and you bring into your storytelling. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, great question. Okay, I'm gonna to try to keep this short. Um, well, whenever I give uh, writing workshops for children, um, I always uh, I use something I call three C's. Conflict, climax, and character. That whenever I write a story or tell a story, I, there's got to be good conflict. There has to be a problem to be solved. Um, and that this, this conflict should always arrive at a climax, the moment you've been waiting for. And whether your climax has a resolution doesn't matter. Possibly your story has a lesson to teach if there is no uh, resolution. So those are three things that I always tell anybody about a story. If your story has no conflict, that, uh, or, or the that the character or the journey that our hero and the story has to go through to resolve, then you're, I'm not saying you're going to have a boring story, but you're gonna have a much more interesting story with conflict. I might be telling you something really obvious that you already know, you probably, probably do. And, and in terms of telling stories, I mean, I, I, all I can say is honesty, and trust yourself, trust your voice. Don't try to embellish it by adding on emotions or characteristics that you think might uh, make your audience member pay attention more. Just tell your story simply and honestly, and the rest will take care of itself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Oh, thank you. We have Paula. Paula. Yes. So my question is like a funny slash interesting question. I saw that episode of Kate Boss. And you did? Yeah. <laughs> what, Dude, when? when? Uh, it was a couple of years ago in Italy. We have a yeah. chat. Yeah, because so you, the, yeah, you get the Kate Boss in Italy, right? Yes. It's very popular. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I wasn't sure. He's Italian. That is great, Paul. You made my day. <laughs> and I just want to ask you, uh, how was the experience? It was incredible. It was incredible. Um, it took two years to get the cake boss interested in this story. I had to write to the producers because I was watching the show with my wife, and I said, "Oh my God, this is my grandfather's story is perfect." perfect for the for, for for cake boss and buddy velastro is italian american and he'll get excited about it and i wrote to the producers and nothing i i got nothing for like two years and i thought wow this is really ridiculous i mean this is such a fit 
And then two years later, out of nowhere, I hear from the producers and I said, this would be a great, perfect story. And, the, and we're really excited about doing it. And so um, it was incredible. I went to uh, the factory where they make the uh, cakes and they filmed us, uh, me meeting Buddy. And, uh, and then we had a Luigi Del Bianco day in Porchester. And I have to tell you, one of the things that cracked me up was um, the day, if you, you, you know the show, Buddy always comes in his big white truck with yeah. the cake inside, right? And he pulls up to the location and he takes the cake out. And one of my family members was outside smoking a cigarette while we were all waiting for Buddy to come. And he took a little walk and he noticed Buddy about maybe 800 feet from the location came in his yellow Ferrari. <laughs> he drove in his yellow Ferrari, got out of his Ferrari, they pulled up the truck, he gets in the truck, and then he pulls up. So Buddy thinks he's like a movie star. He's very funny. He thinks he's like a movie star. He, he drives most of the way in his Ferrari, then gets in his old beat up white truck to look like the working class, you know, baker. Because <laughs> he's a millionaire, let's face it. Um, but he couldn't have been a nicer guy. He couldn't have been a nicer guy. And he stayed so long and signed autographs and talked to the people. And uh, it still excites me when people tell me that they saw the show. I'm so glad that you saw it. Yeah, I saw it. It was, like, great. I, oh. I like it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad. Was the cake? The cake would look wonderful. You know, they looked very beautiful. But was it good also? The taste of the cake. Uh, no, honestly, you know what it was, Margarita. Most of the cake is like wood and plywood. It's like building a set piece, oh, oh, and oh, then that's... there's all that Rice Krispies uh, stuff. Yeah. And then there's just like pound cake with yeah. buttercream frosting. So it's kind of boring. What they do is um, because it was such a big cake. They bought in really delicious sheet cakes in a separate truck. Ah, uh, okay. So they do the ceremonial cut, right? And they give me the piece and I eat it and I go, yummy, you know, it's great. And then afterwards they bring in these sheet cakes, which have nothing to do with the cake. And that's what everybody ate. Because we had like 200 people there. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, Alessandra. Yeah, I would like Steve also Hello. introduce Alessandra De Marco. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just like to, I would like to thank Lou for um, his wonderful story, the wonderful story he told us. I heard about uh, Luigi Del Bianco's story from Margarita. I didn't know about it, so I was very happy to to get the full picture today. I don't have a great questions like the ones that came before me, but I was thinking, have you ever tried to pitch for a movie about your grandfather? Because I think maybe that would be um, great to have movies about uh, Italians uh, that may help make uh, that left um, that, that contributed to the history of America of the United States uh, and would de definitely act as a much more positive role model instead of uh, you know. Um, What's his name? Uh, the, the Godfather. Right. Exactly. Isn't it about time that we had um, a different, different depiction of Italian Americans in in the movies? What do you think? Since you're an actor as well, so I, you know, it, it just came to me like we have so many movies about African Americans that have contributed to the history of the United States. So, um, so many books, and uh, there are lots of writers and uh, scholars of Italian American literature. But I guess maybe we could have a little more uh, positive depictions in the movies. Do you think the public is ready for that? Yeah, I, I, I you know, it's interesting. We in in Hollywood in America, from the beginning of film, there has always been a fascination with the criminal, the gangster, and the outlaw through the westerns and through the gangster movies with the old stars like Jimmy Cagney. So, but, and I think the Italian American gangsters started there um, with Edward G. Robinson playing gangsters. And then when The Godfather came out 
and really romanticized the mafia. I mean, that the Colleoni family was like royalty to the Italian American moviegoer. And I could remember my older brothers and sister, my older sister's friends, when they when they saw the movie, they were like, I want to be in the mafia. They all wanted to be in the mafia because they'd be rich, wealthy, and powerful, and everybody would fear them. And that became an iconic um, image for young Italian Americans. And it has propagated itself to today. And it's still going on because it makes money. People want to see these criminals. They want to live vicariously through them. And, and um, Alessandra, I have a screenplay for a movie about my grandfather and his experience at Rushmore. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point a producer will say, this has value. Well, it certainly has had has had value for us to find that producer um, more sooner than later. <laughs> I, I have I actually have somebody right now, and we're just waiting for the right time to sh pitch this movie because politically mm -hmm. there is a lot of tension in this country right now because Mount because our President Trump spoke in front of Mount Rushmore. And the people who see Mount Rushmore as a, a as a as a symbol of white supremacy are uh, very angry about some of these monuments. And mm -hmm. uh, Hollywood is uh, very liberal politically, and we're just waiting for the new administration to come in with President Biden, who will, I think will be a calming uh, presence in our country, and that um, the groups that are very angry about this will, will will calm down a little, and that that this and that people will see that this is the kind of movie that um, that it, that is an immigrant story would be something of value for 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 for, 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 for today's um, population because we are a country of immigrants, obviously. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. So thank you very much. Anna Clara, did you raise your hand again? Anna, because I see there is uh, Anna Clara. No, maybe it's from before. No, no, so not qui, dimmi. Did you raise your hand again? Because I see no, it. No, 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 no. No, okay. So is there any other question? No, but besides, we are 10 minutes later we have to finish our class Steve. so lou thank you so 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 much you know after reading your book i don't see you just as the defender of your grandfather and, and your family in general but of italian americans and we've got to find a way to you know to, to find more venues for you to to do this type of advocacy and can't thank you enough. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I'm right back at you. I mean, I read your wonderful book, and uh, I, you've been such a support to me and so generous. I'm just glad. Yeah, and of course, Margarita, I know we've been talking about this for a while, and I'm so glad it finally happened. Me too. And Lou, oh, Lou just one last thing. I, I'm a grant writer by profession. If you ever need me, you got me pro bono. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Okay. I don't know what to say. Thank you. That's very generous. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. I have to, you know, to quit the class because we are, you know, late. Lou, thank you very much. It's been wonderful. Fantastic. Bella, Bella Cugina, Bella Cugina. Thank you. You're, you're the best. Yes. Yes. And I speak and like. And like, your students, the students were incredible. Yes. I have fallen in love with your students. What, what can I say? Can they email you just in case they have other Yes, yeah, of course. I would love to hear from them. And he's on Facebook too. Yeah, yeah. Please reach out. Please reach out. I feel like I've made some friends. All right, I know you I know we have to we have to stop now. So whenever okay. you're <laughs> thank you again. Okay, stay safe. God bless you. God bless you. Thank God. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.